Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am joined today by my friend Angela Sells, who is a PhD and a professor in women's studies. She's also a writer for Tom Tom Magazine and a drummer for the Seattle-based band Below Black Star. Angela, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you so much. Um, I love drum history, so I really appreciate you having me on today. Awesome. Well, that is great, and we've been talking for a little bit about uh, about getting you on here, so I'm excited to finally have you on the show. Um, so today's topic, which you are an expert on, and I am excited to learn from you um, with all the listeners, is all about female drummers and the history of female drummers going through the jazz era all the way back to ancient times. So... Why don't we just start off by you going back as far as you can and giving us a brief history on uh, where female drumming began? Sure. Um, First, I do want to preface by saying that I am researching this topic and was heavily influenced by two major books on the topic, Um, When the Drummers Were Women by Lane Redmond and Women Drummers by Angela Smith. And I have been trying to bridge the two from a an historical perspective, so going from ancient Mesopotamia, you know, through the jazz years, and and putting my women's studies lens on it. So that's kind of where I'll be coming from today. But let's start with um, the oldest surviving literature, circa 2100 BC, um, which was uh, found on a clay tablet. Um, it's Uh, an ancient Mesopotamian text called the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, modern-day modern-day Iraq. Um, The oral tradition goes back to about 4000 BC, but there is a a short story, um, if you will, in this epic poem of the goddess Inanna and her tree. And I'll make it um, short. The abridged version is that there's this tree that Inanna wanted. Um, She was going to fashion a throne out of it. And a serpent took up residence in it alongside a demon woman named Lilith. Um, If any of this sounds familiar, it should. Um, The hero Gilgamesh slayed the serpent, um, and as well as the, the demon. And in gratitude, Inanna fashioned him a drum and drumsticks for his heroism. And that is one of the first real instances that we see, at least in narrative, of the drum being mentioned, um, especially as a a tool of appreciation uh, by a woman. And so I really, I think that is a fun place, you know, thousands of years ago to start with the image of the drum. Yeah, that's fascinating. And it's also got that kind of... uh not biblical, but that sort of like uh, mm-hmm. mysticism mm-hmm. kind of feel to it, where it's 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 extremely powerful. Yes, absolutely. Just rich in in metaphor and symbology, and we can go back even further to um, let's see, about fifty two hundred BC to Chatulhuyuk, which was uh, modern day Turkey. Um, And I probably butchered the pronunciation, but it was a a proto-civilization, thriving art uh, scene, murals, statues, altars, ritual sites, burial mounds, shrines, temples, etc. And we see uh, female figures, you know, that were discovered through archaeological um, excavations with moon symbols, carvings of moons, um, carvings of... Uh, drums, and that's been thought to represent the uh, powerful connection between the moon symbol and the pregnant woman, that the mound you know, was represented representative of the heartbeat, the moon and the woman's uh, pregnant belly kind of being this one symbol for creation. And what do you, what do you hear? What is the first beat, the heartbeat? And that is really why we find so many thousands of female figures with this drum um, as represent, uh, representing uh, the connection between uh, birth and the heartbeat. And so often drums were used in fertility rituals as, you know, the beating of the drum mimicking the heartbeat. 
And I think that is not only a beautiful symbol, and all of this is really abridged. You know, there's there's a lot of nuance there, but just that symbol alone um, being, you know, the, the image of the moon and representing um, fertility and the heartbeat, I think, brings us back to the drums, back to this really primitive um, and primal place where, where we can kind of take pride in the drums as the first heartbeat. Yeah, and it's this the repetition of the drum, of the beat, and everything like that. And then the, the moon tying it all together. That's extremely cool. Yeah, and I think, um, is it the new uh, Evans heads, too, that are that look like the moon you know, yeah we've, we've seen yeah where it's kind of got that that like uh that like <laughs> fiber skin kind of like uh feel mm-hmm. yeah those are awesome mm-hmm. i never thought about that wow those are awesome and to me I, I i look at that and i think you know i'm immediately kind of transported and, and i feel like oh here here we're coming full circle with this um this relationship between the moon and what that was representing for thousands of years to uh, women and, and giving birth. Yeah, man, that's cool. That is um, that is some serious drum history right there. <laughs> um, and we can go, you know, for, for thousands of years seeing uh, across cultures, goddesses with um, moon, you know, discs on their heads or statues of female figures uh, holding frame drums, and I sent a few pictures. I'm not sure if um, those can go up anywhere, yeah. but I thought I would just mention a few. Absolutely, I will. Uh, if you want to run through them, then yeah, I will post them because I, I I have them and they're beautiful statues. Sure, yeah. sure. So one of the uh, an ancient goddess known for fertility. Um, there's a bronze statue I sent of Sybil from the second century. And what I find amusing about this particular um, statue is that uh, for a few uh, years, you know, a few decades in scholarship, she was referred to as, um, you know, Sybil, goddess with cake. You know, it, it wasn't Weird. <laughs> assumed that it was a drum, you know, and just kind of the associations of women and cooking, I think, took over <laughs> any sort of archaeological thinking wow. there. That's <laughs> funny. It was, it was a frame drum. Not a cake. <laughs> and Right, not a cake. <laughs> and um, there's Hathor, uh, an ancient, um, well, 2500 B.C., a cow and lion goddess from Egypt. And I think I sent um, an image from 300 BC, but she's also holding a frame drum. It seems like women, it just very powerful. Like they all have this look on their face of like knowledge and power mm-hmm. and um, and like Sib, is it Sybil? Is that correct? Sybil mm-hmm. is just almost mm-hmm. like a, mm-hmm. uh, like a calmness um, to her. Yes. And that particular statue as well mimics um, a statue found in that that ancient civilization or proto-civilization, um, Chatul Hayuk. So you can find a figure from, you know, 5,000, 7,000 B.C., and you see how it morphed uh, through cultures and, and cultural, you know, appropriation and, and later civilizations to Sybil, um, thousands of years later is almost that exact same pose. Yeah. So you see how these ideas, you know, traveled uh, between cultures and, and across the years. And that's something I, I also found interesting. Now, as time went on, was this something that uh, became less common for these women drummers to be featured in statues? Mm-hmm. Did it kind of go away a little bit? It did. So... There's another image of the Maenads um, with their frame drums. And this would be a bit more of the, the image of um, demonizing women and, and drumming as the years went on because it, it became to be associated with um, madness. Hmm. You know, these Maenads, these raving women who were... Um, associated with the god Dionysus, 
came to be considered as crazy women. You know, they they would participate in rituals and they were seen as ecstatic and um, violent and drums were definitely a part of ritual. And as you know, the centuries rolled on um, and civilizations began to form and social structures began to um, cement and, and roles began to to cement in place and family roles and traditions, um, what do we see happen? Well, we see the need for possessions and to retain possessions. And how do you retain possessions but through an heir? How do you make sure that in, that there's a lawful heir is to um, make sure that you know, women's reproduction is, is kept in check? So instead of promoting images of, of you know, raving women participating in fertility ritual, which um, went for thousands of years, um, you know, hand in hand with with sexual liberation at times, uh, that was really reined in as civilizations began to be less nomadic and more um, stationary, more um, able to stay in one place due to um, grains and and less of a need to chase, you know, um, whatever was in season. So that's really the start of of when things began to shift as far as roles and women participating in these kinds of rituals where drumming um, fostered, you know, a a sexuality um, that was, hand in hand with fertility. So at that point, they said, basically, you need to stop doing these rituals, you need to stop playing this drum, you need to now fit the modern representation of what a woman should be or what they think it is. Subliminally, it's kind of like controlling the future by changing art. Absolutely. And and because I think we're such a visual culture, and especially now, we're influenced by, you know, media representation. And I think we reflect what is, you know, reflected back to us. And so um, I do want to say, too, you know, this change I'm talking about wasn't overnight. I mean, we're, we're spanning, um, you know, a few centuries here. And, and so the change was gradual with depiction and representation, and especially participation in these fertility rituals but but even the change from representing women and drums um, with maenads in you know 400 BC where there are these raving lunatics versus you know a few centuries before a thousand years before when it was um, the realm of the goddess I mean even that is a, is a pretty distinct change. Yeah, I mean, and also just like hearing you say that a thousand years is a long time. Like who knows what will be happening well, that's what I mean. <laughs> in the year 3019. It's like right. robots will be ruling the world and drums won't exist or something like that. So um, yeah. <laughs> I hope not. But um, now moving forward a little bit in time um, past the ancient kind of realm. Right. What was happening, um, like fast forward a little bit, I'm not saying get into like the 1930s now, but like, you know, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, yeah. Right, yeah. So so over the years when monotheism was on the rise, because that's the next distinct change, is the rise of, of monotheism, and these rituals, which were heavily... Uh, you know, influenced by music, and I'm not talking about military drumming, you know, but specifically drumming that was, um, went hand in hand with ritual. Well, with the rise of monotheism, all of that began to be seen or interpreted as pagan and demonized. So that's when we now get this moral, um, the issue of morality imposed on drumming, Hmm. specifically in ritual. So by the 1600s, 1700s, where women's roles are much more defined with the church and state, um, for instance, there's this um, Carl uh, Ludwig um, uh, Juncker, this composer, he wrote a, a decorum for ladies that was circulated in the 1700s and their roles as audience rather than participants in music. And his 
line of thinking was that it was comp- completely unsuitable um, for women to participate in playing music because of the bodily movement oh my God. that they would make. Wow. <laughs> and so specifically for drumming, um, he writes, it would be ridiculous uh, when we see her playing in a fancy hairdo. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I mean, which is, it's amusing, but this was actually, you know, circulated. This this is representative of, of the thinking of, of for hundreds of years, you know, that that aesthetically it was much more important to be demure rather than to, you know, play in a, in a manner that would, um, you know, rile your fashion of clothing or your hairdo. Wow. And um, so we can see that kind of imposition. Man, what a jerk. It's like you're, you're to be seen and not heard, <laughs> basically. <laughs> but that was really the role, you know, that the, uh, music... Um, played as far as church and, and state and, and gender roles of the time for hundreds of years, um, you know, if not thousands, but specifically hundreds of years um, as we're working our way up to the jazz era, that uh, that was held for women who wanted to play music. So what do you think happened if, you know, this was the social belief? What might that do to women of, of the era who wanted to play music they were complete aberrations was it like they're hiding and and, and trying to be like secretive about it or would they just basically not do it i mean there it really kind of depends on you know which country we're talking about but but in the west at least there um, as we move up to kind of the 1930s um, from the mid 1700s um, through the 1800s there was vaudeville um you know, vaudeville and minstrel shows, specifically in America, minstrel shows, where women were not at first allowed to participate in these shows, but slowly they were they were allowed to um, represent certain roles. And then these vaudeville acts kind of paved the way for, you know, so-called girly shows. Like the women, you know, would could be let in as this titillating act hmm. and there would be musicians um you know female musician performers in these acts um slowly integrated over time but it it's a very difficult road and very specific um uh you know manners of behaving while on stage was it like a like a novelty act at first basically like come come mm-hmm. see these women mm-hmm. play yeah, exactly. wow that's pretty tough but honest exactly. honestly it's like a it sounds like it's like, well, just get your foot in the door and let it become the norm. Right. And then just, they'll all, you know, you'll be laughing later when you're a successful musician kind of thing. But that had to be horrible to not be able to do well, what you love. Well, and I mean, it's so complicated too. And I, I don't want to gloss over how complicated it was. But if we're talking, for instance, just about minstrel shows in America, Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, you know, made their name by being black performers in minstrel shows and it's like you're saying foot in the door and it is not without complication but isn't that interesting as far as the kind of changing landscape as far as what would be allowed or um, what would sell tickets because you know Bessie Smith was extremely popular yeah so it's it's all just very complicated especially when you get to you know the topics of of women performers or uh, performers of color it's there's so so much challenge um, that was faced. Yeah, and I'm sure they weren't being paid an equal amount, and I'm sure someone was trying to screw right. them over, <laughs> and some guy was getting all of the money, and I, I bet that goes for men of color and and all this stuff. So it is a mm-hmm. it is a hard time, um, but obviously people, obviously women were per- persistent at that point in time and mm-hmm. stuck with it, and um, yeah. Absolutely. And, and facing, you know, these odds, too, that I just wanted to briefly point out, because I read the, the composer's quote, something else over, you know, in America that was um, a, not a reputation to rebel against, but an actual code, um, for instance, from South Carolina and, and slave states um, before the Civil War, um, actually banned 
all African Americans from playing drums at all. So, I mean, there's there's an exception with New Orleans, which is its whole own other thing. Um, and I don't want to touch on on that history, but that was that was different. But in um, slave states, drums were considered a threat because they were seen as as potentially calling together or giving signs of notice to one another, mm. of design or purpose to break free. So they weren't allowed to use or keep drums for the most part for years, and that's just one code like that. Um, and so you have, you know, the years, the fallout, obviously, during Reconstruction of trying to break free from not just slavery, but from codes where your instrument was, was you know, literally taken away from you. So how do you then persist in the face of that history? And so that's something I also find really fascinating is, you know, really where the drum originated and then and then what was taken away and what was really fought to reclaim in the years leading up to jazz. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's wild. It's you kind of forget about something like drums being uh, a tribal, like a call to action. Um, and just we right. see it as just a musical instrument. But I could see that where they'd think mm-hmm. this certain beat is going to let people know tonight we're mm-hmm. fleeing or whatever. That's fascinating. Right. Right. Exactly. So just one more piece that I, I find really um, important leading up to, you know, the the big band era or, you know, the, the 20s, 30s and 40s when we have all of all of the historical pieces in place for so many drummers to then come forward and, and kind of claim this piece of history fighting against all the odds. Yeah. And so that point in time is is obviously a very male driven time where you think of Gene Krupa and you think mm-hmm. of these these early guys sure. playing but w- what was happening so let's fast forward up to the point of the big band the jazz the 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 sure, post sure. i guess that would be like in the 30s late 20s 30s era sure so <clears throat> uh, one of the the bands that definitely captured my uh, attention was the the international sweethearts of rhythm and they were the first integrated all-women's band uh, in the United States. And I believe they formed in, officially in 1937 um, and then be- gained popularity in the 1940s. But they started uh, out of the Piney Woods School, the Piney Woods Country Life School out of Mississippi. And what's pretty amazing um, about that is that the, a lot of the original members had been going to school um, there, and then the the band was this offshoot um, from the students. And we're talking about kids, you know, 14 to 19 year old uh, women, and we get one of, in my mind, you know, one of the most talented drummers, Pauline Brady, who um, there's uh, Lady Be Good. Um, that, that song that you can find on YouTube and that really showcases that, that kind of pounding driving force of, of hers. Um, and she, you know, she was relatively um, still just a kid. I mean, I, I believe she was about 20, 21 during that recording. And that's, that's something that we, we miss when we think about these, these all women bands is how young they were at the time. Um, when they were playing and, and the circumstances that they came out of, um, for instance, Dr. Lawrence Jones, who founded this, this school for poor um, Afri- African-American children and other children, um, this is where they came from. And they, they began to play and they became the international sweethearts. They were the first um, African American women to tour with the USO. You know, they traveled all around the world, all around the nation. Um, were hugely successful in the early 1940s, and um, especially Pauline, though, as the drummer, had impressed uh, other drummers like you know, Big Sid Catlett, Papa Joe Jones. Um, took some some lessons, you know, with them, and we we don't really hear about that history, but they were, I believe, the most successful 
um, all women's band during the early 40s. Wow. And just so people know, it's International Sweethearts of Rhythm, and the song is Lady Be Good, and I listened through it, and it has, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, the drum solo is awesome. Very uh, powerful. Um, So I recommend everyone checks that out. And it's cool to hear that people like Papa Joe Jones and everyone would... I think drummers see oh, yeah. drummers as what they are as opposed to um, a man or a woman or black or white. And obviously not every drummer right. is like that, but um, it's just cool to hear that they would they would work together. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, they were extremely popular. And, and yes, you know, we can get into the nuance of kind of being a novelty, but it really goes beyond that. Like you're saying, it, it cuts through gender, race. They were an amazing band you know, just at the heart of it, bottom line. The novelty factor of it, too, is like, it's kind of like to catch on. I see it more as like, hey, here's our, not a gimmick, but here's something to draw you into listening to them versus like, look at these women, that's a novelty. I think it's, they're just such good musicians. It it draws people in. Oh, absolutely. Um, And and especially when considering their their ages, that's what blew me away. Really? I mean, I mean, really, that's just phenomenal. And the fact that they were up against, um, you know, Jim Crow South when they were touring, um, because there were uh, white women also in the band, but when they were touring, it was illegal in Jim Crow South to be in a mixed band. So they would sleep on the bus. You know, there were a few arrests because police um, noticed that, you know, there there were some women who were playing in an integrated band, and those women... Those musicians were then arrested, and some spent their their time in jail. Oh and that's what they were facing to tour, to do what they love, to bring music to the people. Um, in those circumstances, that's you know that's how they um, were still so successful. Though they they went up against all of that, they did what they had to do. Wow. Well, that's uh, I feel like they're a huge inspiration to every drummer who's facing some sort of uh obstacle today just to keep mm-hmm. keep with it and mm-hmm. and uh it could always be worse i mean you could be in that situation you could be arrested for oh, yeah. playing the drums <laughs> so wow there's this um tampa i believe it's tampa bay review um from the an early 40s performance and i just wanted to call attention to um the journalist who's spotlighting the sensational drumming of pauline and in reviews, Pauline is always mentioned. Her drumming is always called out um, when there's a review of a performance from the Sweethearts because she was really uh, well regarded. She was she was really thought of as a powerhouse drummer at the time, and there were a lot of reasons why they were so successful in the years they were. I mean. Um, you know, how many millions of men were called away during World War II, really opening up spots for women in all different aspects of life at the time, you know, when the image of Rosie the Riveter yeah. became popular. But these female musicians were able to to take the stage and, and um, get the time that they deserved and, and filling in these spots around the nation. And one other musician, one other drummer, Viola Smith, who's in her hundreds. I know, she's like 106, I think, or something like that. It's unbelievable. (laughs) Right. And and still active. Just incredible. But she she was a little older than Pauline, but she was in the the coquette. And she has her um, amazing spot in the snake charmer if anyone's interested to hear her on drums you can actually see her play on video it's cool and and she yeah she was called you know the female jean krupa and and pauline though was was called the queen of the drums and so we have these these amazing women in the jazz era um as drummers who were being you know who were friends with and being mentored by some of the greatest names in drum history. That's amazing. I mean, it's just so cool that it's it's the community. It's the community of drummers. Unfortunately, I'm sure it, it seems like probably something where the men get back from war. Does their position kind of slip from being like performing out mm-hmm. to, okay, now the men are back. Now it's time for you to stop this. I, I could see that being a problem. Well, 
Yes and no. I mean, in a way, yes. <laughs> but also, you know, women getting married, getting older, um, you know, career changes. Mm-hmm. Um, there was not, you know, money was, was tight. So there were a lot of reasons for the the decline. Um, but then especially for the, the sweethearts, though, they were popularized again um, during the women's movement in the 60s and 70s. And so there was um, a, a large resurgence um, for the band. Cool. So they were still going in the 60s and 70s. Well, it officially, um, you know, folded earlier. But then there was just the, the women who were around were able to come together, you know, invited to universities, invited to jazz um, conferences to talk you know, about their experiences. Um, there was a, a documentary film about the sweethearts uh, from the 80s um, to to look at their influence on, on later movements. Um, and then that's, that's kind of when the scholarship picked up around their history. Cool. Um, yeah, even considering the name, you know, international sweethearts. They weren't really international. They were just different ethnicities so yeah it's a cool it, name though it's just that, that, <laughs> it is it's oh it's an awesome name it's just the politics around that um you know dr jones knew what he was doing he knew different loopholes you know for the politics of the time and how to market um you know the particular makeup of the band yeah really well it worked i mean i it seems like behind behind yeah. most successful <laughs> bands there's kind of someone pushing things around and making it work to make you successful. And I'm sure this is, this is no different. Sure. Sure. Definitely. Um, and then, you know, too, something to note, just the changing landscape of jazz. I mean, really in the, in the forties, um, when bebop, you know, started to, to kind of take over the, the mainstream. Yeah. Um, it's so, it's so different from, you know, swing or big band that that's also why you see a decline because I'm not entirely convinced, you know, that, that we would have seen that decline um, across the board had just music not been changing. Um, and then especially when you get, you know, through the fifties and the sixties, everything is just completely. Different. Yeah. 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 That all goes away. I mean, that's kind of across the board where the big, even the male drummers, everyone, it's kind of like, that's, you're getting like, you're getting phased I, out a little right. bit because you're not playing the style. Absolutely. That's kind of a good segue to get into that that bebop and then into the 50s and 60s with uh, female drummers, which is a little further than we kind of planned on on talking about. But I'd love to just kind of let's let's keep it going. Let's let's uh, what was going on then? So what you see in the well in the 60s and 70s, especially um, with the the energy of the the women's movement and music changing, you have drummers like Mo Tucker coming on board for Velvet Underground. Yeah. And yeah, and you hear that minimal, the minimalist style that Mo brings to the band coming to the forefront as an image, as, as someone who is an inspiration to others to say, you don't have to play like Gene Krupa. Yeah, really. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because I think that that kind of gets lost in the shuffle too. You know, we're talking about Viola Smith um, and Pauline who are, absolutely amazing but that the buddy rich kind of gene krupa um very technical players very fast um virtuoso incredible but in the 60s and 70s you do have more drummers come on like mo tucker who is also extremely interesting in her own right with her time signatures um but i think what we start to see is just more freedom of expression that every beat doesn't have to, um, you know, include, um, you know, inverse paradiddles. And, yeah. Which is more, more you modern know. now. Like you, you don't need to just shred and just have these jazz, just explosions, which I, I would think is more kind of getting into that modern, just being the backbeat. Right. Exactly. So that's, um, you know, especially too when we when we think about the sixties and we think about you know the Beatles and Yardbirds and um, the Kinks, and you have a lot of uh, a resurgence in 
masculine swagger. Yep. <laughs> um, that's something to also, I think, pay attention to is, as these female musicians of the big band era also kind of faded and then the resurgence during the women's movement, even against that backdrop of, you know, Mick Jagger, et cetera, you know, Hendrix. You, what we see during that era is a slow coming to terms of history. And that's what I find really interesting about someone like Colleen Brady and that she was actually being recognized finally in history during those years. And so in the 70s to the 80s, when we get, you know, um, someone like Sheila E., for instance, we finally, in the late 70s and 80s, have a starting point of history being written down, the compilation of, of, of women drummers in history starts to starts to really occur at that time. Yeah, and Sheila E. is obviously such a famous female drummer, but it, it kind of seems mm-hmm. like, and I'm probably incorrect in this, but it's turning more into less of a, uh, a gimmick of a female drummer and more of just a, you're a good drummer. Like Sheila E. just kind of... Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. She's you just can't deny that she's an amazing drummer. I don't know. It seems past that. Maybe it's just the the time too because it's like it's the 80s and the 90s and it's not, you know, 1935 in America, right. which is just a hard time. Right, right. I mean, and there are, there are a lot of things too between you know big band and, and the 60s. Um the onset of punk is is a huge time for female drummers too, someone like Tom Olive, who was in the splits and the raincoats. And then, and again, we get that kind of, um, you know, DIY aesthetic where those barriers are being broken down and it, you can take a more minimalistic approach and it's not about, um, only about aesthetics. It's about, you know, how do you sound for the song? And while I think that aesthetics still plays kind of a, a big part um, as far as women and drumming, I feel like it's absolutely going in the, the right direction of just how, how do you sound the song? Yeah. Yeah. Now, let me ask you a question. Um, do you think nowadays... Mm-hmm. Is it more of a, like, with the world being, let's say, this is, I'm just completely making this up, but like 90% male drummers in all the bands out there, do you think it's a benefit to be a really good female drummer to help stand out in the world of musicians? Because there's, again, there's so many male drummers, you kind of just blend Mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. I think it really depends. I love the the female musicians who are kind of taking um, the world by storm right now, you know, um, Annika and Nilis, of course, yep. and Emmanuel Kaplan are amazing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm awed by their talent. Yeah. Um, and I think, but it's it's kind of twofold that, yes, it's the talent is completely the number one thing that you think about when you think of, of specifically those two drummers. However, I think that the shadow side is that when you are a female musician, you kind of are compared to the only other visible female musicians. Yeah, that's true. Out there, because we're not inundated um, with so many names. It's like if you're not, you know, one of those two, then you're not really taken as seriously. So you almost have to overperform instead of you know just kind of keep. Beat when two and the four. <laughs> yeah, that's a uh, really, really, really good answer. I mean, because honestly, it's uh, you do need to stick out, and and it, you know, it mm-hmm. kind of seems like the uh, people are are thinking you're not going to be good until they hear you, and then you blow mm-hmm. them away, and you can win them over. Mm-hmm. But it's it's really a shame that you're you're starting off with uh, having to prove yourself. Right, and I and I do love the direction it's going. I think that the tide is changing, um, but I think also just right now in in our present drum history i think it's a really interesting moment where there seems to be an emphasis on um chops you know like odd time signatures and stickings and and these these you know things that you can you can post which are really interesting i'm always you know i do them and i'm um you know going through my carrie chafee books as well (laughs) 
Um, but I, I think that we've gotten a little bit away from that kind of, you know, the amazing ability of, of Ringo, who's just steady, especially on the ride, you know, yeah. with, with every Beatles tune. And just being able as, as a drummer to go back, you know, to that thousands of years old, old thing of just the heartbeat. It's just, we are also beat keepers. And so it's, it's really interesting right now. I, I, um, am excited to see, you know, where we go with, with kind of veering into chop land <laughs> versus keeping a steady beat. Yeah, it is heavy, heavy, heavy chop stuff right now. And it's, uh, it's kind of crazy because drummers keep getting better and better and better because they've seen with YouTube, mm-hmm. everyone keeps getting mm-hmm. better. So mm-hmm. we'll see what happens. I think right now, it, it, everything, what's old becomes new again. So I think at some point, people are going to start right? playing the money 2-4 mm-hmm. beat again and uh, everyone can, you know, it'll turn around. It's interesting. You know, I was listening to Todd Sigerman talk and um, just how how he was playing something really kind of over the top, but nobody's heads were, were bobbing. There was no kind of groove to yeah. it. And, and so he, he went in again and recorded you know, the same song and um, just, just did it a little bit, you know, mild, not milder, but just there was um, some, something for, you know, to bob to. It's like, yeah, that, that's the interesting thing. That's where I would really love to see where we're going right now. Are we moving away from being able to rely on the beat, you know, for, for an audience? Or are we kind of becoming, you know, a, a more insular drum community where we're all out to, to really you know, prove ourselves in that way. Yeah, like, I can confuse you more by playing this extremely choppy <laughs> beat. Um, but, you know, there's guys out there and girls online who um, I think are doing that. I do see a change in that where it's more of, like, listen to this fat snare and just steady right. beat, um, which is awesome. So, and that's a good segue yeah. to talk about you because you are a rock and female drummer. Um, speaking of this topic. <laughs> so what's up with your band? Why don't you talk a little bit about what you're doing and, um, and your work with uh, Tom Tom magazine and, and all that good stuff. So I've been um, subscribing to Tom Tom magazine for years and I um, have been lucky enough to write for them the past few issues and it's the only magazine in the world dedicated to you know, female and non-binary percussionists. And the recent article I wrote that might be of interest is all about music, and it's about um, women's influence on rock and heavy metal and kind of the, the unsung heroes of, of that genre. And I'm in Seattle right now. I'm a writer and a teacher, and my band, uh, Below Black Star, is this kind of um, alt um, Floyd influenced rock band. And we're learning some, some new tunes for the next album. So that is what, what I'm working on at the moment. That's awesome. You had me at Floyd influence. I'm a big. Uh... Floyd guy, so that's cool. Well, Angela, do you have any other uh, any other bits or cool stories about uh, you know the the world of of drumming in for women that you want to share with the world? Sure. I mean, just to just to iterate the the, the book, um, you know, when drummers aren't women or women drummers are, are two that I have become you know my personal bibles, but I'm trying to to again kind of bridge from a historical perspective. Um, along with my own personal research into the drum world of the last two centuries, I just wanted to make it really clear that you know, this has been a sweeping episode, so there's a lot of nuance that I didn't, you know, touch on, and I just wanted to make that clear. You know, that that's on purpose yep. for us right now is to kind of not go into the, the nitty-gritty bibliography of, of all of those notes. But just thank you so much for this um, talk about about drumming. I'm really loving what you're doing. Well, thank you very much. And uh, and you you put it well by saying it's just we're touching on the surface of it. Um, I think with every episode of Drum History, it's like, hey, let's learn about this together and then go off and learn even more because there's just an endless world mm-hmm. of, uh, of of each topic. Um, so 
Right. Well, you are an awesome person. I appreciate everything you're doing. Um, you're a great writer, and I look forward to just <laughs> seeing more stuff that you put out. Yeah, thank you so much. Likewise. And I just, I love your podcast. So I keep it going. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Well, Angela, this has been great. Um, I'll be in touch with you through social media and everything, and, uh, and look forward to talking to you more in the future. Great. Thank you so much. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.